God. Let's praise the Lord together right now. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Praise God. Praise God. We love you this morning, Lord. We thank you for every good and perfect gift, Lord, because we know they come from you. Our Heavenly Father, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, worship team. Thank everybody for sharing your testimonies, prayers, dreams, whatever the Lord has put on your heart. Praise the Lord. We appreciate it. Praise God. God is good. Amen. Thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. When I was in college, I had a crush on my philosophy professor, and uh, she didn't even know if I existed. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Last up, a friend of mine dated a woman who worked at the zoo, and he said she was a keeper. <laughs> Thank the Lord. Amen. God is good, isn't he? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Had a cheese deal the other day. I love cheese. <clears throat> Especially Dutch cheese. It's good. <laughs> That's about all anybody can endure, so we'll just move on. Praise the Lord. Amen. God is good. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, we, uh, I don't know about anybody else, but, and I, but I do know some of the stuff that goes on in all of our lives. And, and I know one of the big challenges is everything that we talked about here today, the, the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. It's, it's the weapon. It's the main weapon that we have to use against the enemy. <clears throat> and so that's one of the reasons why we're talking about confessing the Word and being consistent in that because the enemy comes for the word. So it's not unusual or unlikely that you'll confess things and then see opposite results immediately. But you have to keep confessing. Amen. I don't know about anybody else. I've never really been in a sword fight. Uh, I have been in a knife fight, but uh, <clears throat> that's a little bit different. But I know one thing. Uh, if you're going to get in a fight with a blade, it ain't going to end with one poke. Yeah. You know? You better be ready for some serious getting after it. Amen. And that's what we're talking about using the sword of the Spirit. You're not just going to swing once at the enemy and he's going to run. He's going to come back at you. Amen. And try to de you know, uh, disarm you. Amen. And the only real weapon we have here <clears throat> in terms of defeating the enemy is the Word of God. Because that's one thing that's consistent. It, it won't change. Amen. It, it will produce after its own kind. Yes. It has to. That's the Word of God. Right. You, can, you can say what your experience is. You can tell me what somebody else had. But I'm telling you, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. And if it's not working, it's because you're not consistently using it, right. amen, as you should. And the closer we get into these last times, the last days, we've heard dreams, we've heard uh, testimonies of, and other things about, we know, just by the world that we live in, we know the way that it is. Anybody of any age here grew up in, in a whole different world. Not necessarily better, but different. I mean, it's all together. Things have changed dramatically, Amen. even in the last 25 years. And mm -hmm. in, uh, in many of it in negative ways. But there's spiritual influences that affect the natural. We know that there are. That's where the evil and all the bad stuff comes from. It's, it's demonic forces. Well, it works the same way with the kingdom of God. The spiritual reality is what needs to be manifest here. You know, this is what Karen was talking about, us coming together, us sticking together, us saying, because the enemy, in the last days, it says darkness will, will be greater and greater. 
Amen. The enemy will, will look like he's going to overpower everything, but that's when the glory of God will really shine through. When the church rises up for who they really are and comes together, unifies, amen, with the word of God and begins to speak and declare some things, things will start changing. Yes. Amen. And it'll usher in the return of the Lord, yes. the literal return of God. Yes. Amen. So in the meantime, you're going to have struggles. All of us, I, I'm not going to ask for a raising of hands because I know it happens to all of us. All of us have promises. All of us have made confessions and have not necessarily seen the fulfillment of that confession yet. But you keep doing it until you get the manifestation. That's just the way it works, no matter how long it takes. Amen. Now, here's the deal. We've made it drudgery. We've made it painful. We've made it something to complain about instead of enjoying the process. And that's what God's wanting us to understand. So that's what I really want to talk to you about in a roundabout way here this morning. So I want to begin, uh, Peter, with Romans chapter 8 and read verses 24 and 25. Romans 8, 24 and 25. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Yeah. Don and all of you were talking about the spirit realm. Don mentioned that we are spirits, and that's the thing that we lose track of so much of the time. We, because we're always dealing in the natural in the flesh, we forget what our true identity is. We are really spirits. The way spirits operate is by the word of God. When you read the scriptures, unless you're looking at them through spiritual eyes, it's just a book of a, a bunch of rules and regulations. It's only when you really begin to see by the Spirit, which is why Jesus sent back His Spirit so that we could operate the way He did. What Jesus did was, He said, it's the Father that's in me, He does the works. I'm listening to Him, the Holy Spirit, which He sent back for us, so that we could function just like Him. Problem is, we never listen to the Holy Spirit or work, uh, you know, work out from the Word of God. We just basically wing it. And then pray for help when we get into the mess. Yeah. Right? Instead of, instead of being the, uh, the aggressor, so to speak, or, or the initiator, we always become reactionary. We're always re reacting to some circumstance or situation that's in the world instead of taking authority over it. Amen? Exactly. So this is speaking to us spiritually, okay? Uh, look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18. 2 Corinthians 4 and 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Exactly. In other words, what you're seeing here, it can be changed by the Word of God, but the Word of God is forever settled. Yes. The, the, the heavenly realm is fixed. Yes. It's not going to change. Amen? So, it's here where we need change. Yes. We are either thermometer Christians or thermostat Christians. Don will appreciate this. <laughs> Thermometers tell you what is. Right. Thermostats are to change what is. Right. You set the thermostat and it will call for a change until that change comes. Yes. If the thermostat's working, you, yes. you, it's 80 degrees, you want 72. You set it on 72, you're calling for 72 degrees. Yes, sure. Amen? Mm -hmm. And it will continue to call for 72 degrees until it is 72 yes, degrees. That's right. It'll change the reality yes. from being uncomfortably hot to being comfortable. Yes. Right? Yes. A thermometer has one purpose, and that's to tell you what is. A thermostat has one purpose, and that's to change what is to what you want. Yes. Yes. We need to be thermostats, yes. not thermometers. The problem with most Christians is we just run around talking about what is yeah. exactly. instead of what could be or what should be. Yeah. Right. We need to start calling for some stuff in order for that to change. Yes. And nothing's going to change if you keep repeating what you got. This doesn't work. I, I don't know. I prayed for a month. I, I confessed this for three weeks and it hasn't worked. Yeah. And depending on how hot it is, may determine how long it takes for that thermostat to change what the thermometer is saying. Yeah. But if, you, if it's functioning 
and it continues to function, it will definitely change the thermostat eventually. It will bring it, it will call in whatever it is you set it on. And that's what we need to be doing. We need to be calling in what the Word of God says. We need to be speaking of things that are not as though they are. Because that's the only way they're going to change. Otherwise, the temporary rules us. And we are eternal beings. We're not, we're not temporary. The only thing temporary about us is the thing that, that gives us access into this world. And that's our bodies. Who we are is eternal. See, that's the deal. <laughs> the Spirit is always calling the body, always calling this thing and this thing to agree. Yes. It's the thermostat is saying, hey, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. The problem is, our thermometer is telling us something altogether different. We need to be listening to the thermostat because God said, whatever, I, whatever the word is that I send, it comes down like the rain and the, and the snow, and it will not come back to me void. In other words, whatever I call it, if I can get somebody to call the same thing, it will become whatever it is we have said. It, the thermostat will dominate, in other words. All right, look at Luke chapter 17 and verse 6. And this is Jesus speaking to this very subject. He said, the Lord said, if, if, I, if you had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you might say to the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, be thou planted in the sea, and it would what? It would obey you. If you have just a little bit of faith, just a tiny amount of faith, and you start saying what God says, whatever that thing is you're speaking to, it has to obey. Yes. Now you can, I, again, I know you can say, well, that's not, that's not practically true in my life. But, but then it's because you're not consistently doing this. You're messing with the thermostat all the time. Yep. <coughs> Praise the Lord. So, look at, let's look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13. See, we, instead of acting like spirits, we've tried to just discipline the body a bunch. You know, give it enough rules and regulations and then it will, it will behave. It won't. It just won't. The more rules you give it, the more rules it will break. And the more condemnation and the more guilt that will come. That's why Jesus came and fulfilled all the law so the law could be done away with and we could quit messing with that and start operating as spirits like we're really supposed to be. So we have this, having the, now this is talking about Jesus leading up to this. I'm just not reading all of it for the sake of time. But he says, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, the same spirit of, what same spirit of faith? The same spirit of faith that Jesus had, right. which is God. He is a faith spirit. So we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe, and therefore have I spoken, we also believe, and therefore speak. Right. It's Jesus Saying, I only say what my Father says. Yes. That's the spirit of faith that He had. And we have that same spirit of faith. Yes. Right? We have God, the Holy Spirit in us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. We have the same thing, the fullness of the Godhead in us bodily, the same thing Jesus had. And because of that spirit of faith, as it is written, I believe, therefore I speak. Right? Yeah. We also believe and therefore we speak. That's how, that's how it's supposed to work. We have the spirit of faith, just the same as Jesus. And if you have the spirit of faith, you're going to call for some stuff. You're going to say some things. If you're operating the way you're supposed to. Look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. We've all been given a measure of faith. I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. What is that right here? Yeah. This is the measure of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Everybody has access or the ability to the same faith, the same measure. Just a question of how you appropriate or how you execute. True. You understand what I'm saying? This is, everybody has this. Every man gets a measure of faith. Yes. The, the result of that faith is dependent on how much of this you believe and how much of this you're going to act on. Yeah. So you can have all of this. How many, we know people that have Bibles. Two or three of them in their home. They're not believers. They're not even saved. Yes. Right? right? But 
to what you believe is what you get. The more you believe, the more you get. So you could be, you know, I'm not picking on any religion, but you know, you could say, <coughs> excuse me, a Lutheran, a Catholic, a Baptist. They all have the same measure of faith, but they're not exercising the same measure of faith. Why? Because they don't believe everything that's there. Therefore, they're not speaking. Healing, deliverance, all these other things that we, that we understand to be realities, right? So look at 2 Corinthians now, chapter 4, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, the Word of God. He is the Word. The Word became flesh. Yes. So He shines out of darkness. What? He gives us revelation. He shines that revelation into our spirit to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God or the awareness of God and, and how we operate yeah. in that awareness. Amen? Jesus came so we can have the glory of God. Verse 7. So now, he's telling, he just goes on to say, this thing that we're talking about here, this, this faith, this glory of God, we have this treasure, but it's in a vessel. It's in an earthen vessel. It's in a physical body. Amen? So that the excellency, the power may be of God and not of us. Right. So we don't take the credit for it any more than Jesus did. He said, I can do nothing of myself. It's the Father that's in me. Right. right? All right, so we have a treasure in this physical body. We have God's power. We have the exact Spirit of Christ, the power of God, the glory of God, the Spirit of God in us. Just like Jesus. Amen. Verse 8. And here's reality. We are troubled on every side. Yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. We live in a world that is affected by sin and by Satan. The world is still fallen. It's we that have been redeemed. Yes. Amen. The world is waiting. All of creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Yes. So we're troubled, but not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Amen. I, I guarantee you we are distressed at times and we are perplexed at times. But I can't honestly say that we're not sometimes also in despair. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Why? Because we're not doing the things that preceded this. Paul said we are in a world that is fallen. It's chaotic. It's messed up. It's demonically influenced. Amen. We're, so we're troubled because of that. Because this doesn't just happen. Because the, there's an enemy here to stop this reality. Which is why we are here to make this a reality. To make God's truth manifest in the earth. Amen. So he says the reason we're troubled but not distressed. And the reason that we're perplexed or confused sometimes by the stuff that's going on around us. Because it doesn't line up with this. It doesn't match this. Amen. But we're not in despair. Is that we understand that he that's in us is greater than he that's in the world. So we got problems, we got, but we're not going to let it overwhelm us because we, we know deep down inside, ultimately, the one that's in me is greater than the one that's telling all these lies and trying to get me to believe everything that's contradicting the Word of God. Amen? So go back now, if you will, to 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13. <coughs> Excuse me. Thanks. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. All right? We have to stop being thermometers, and we got to start being thermostats. Right. Praise the Lord. Yes. Look, take David for an example, man after God's own heart. Look at Psalms 116 and verses 5 through 10. <coughs> One sixteen. I'm sorry, Peter. No. Psalms one sixteen five through ten. <clears throat> so this is David speaking, and uh, he says, "Gracious is the Lord." In fact, I, I won't have you go back to it, but let me just show you how he starts out here. I 
I love the Lord because He hath heard my voice. This is verse 1. He, because, why does He love the Lord? Because the Lord listens to Him. Because the Lord heard His voice and my supplications. Because He hath inclined His ear unto me, therefore will I call upon Him as long as I live. So then He drops down to verse 5. And He says, Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and He helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul. The Lord is, is our rest, right? The Lord hath dealt bountifully with me, or with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. So Paul simply is quoting David is the prototype here. And then he says this, all this about Jesus. And then in 2 Corinthians 4.13 he says, And we have the same spirit of faith. Yeah. So we believe and we speak. That's what David was doing. That's one of the reasons why he was a man after God's own heart. Yeah. He didn't say what he saw. He said what he believed yes. God for. Amen. Yes. See, the enemy always tests us at the point of our faith. That's, that's why he comes for the word. Why? Because it's by the word that we receive faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the enemy's always going to test you, amen, at your point of faith. Whatever you're confessing, that's when he's going to come and try to deny. The very fact that he does it is evidence that it's faith operating here. Amen? So look at, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, verses, uh, verse 32. But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, or after you got revelation, you endured a great fight of affliction. How many can say amen to that? You get a word. You get a promise. You get a, so I'm believing for this. And immediately the enemy afflicts you. He immediately comes to disturb everything and to cause you to doubt, right? After you were illuminated, you endured a great fight. Partly while she were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while she became companions of them that were so used. All right? Verse 35. Sorry. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which have great recompense of reward. So you get the word, you respond to the word. And affliction comes. But don't give up. Don't cast away your confidence in the word of God. Because there's a great recompense or a great reward to come if you don't cast away. Yeah. Amen. So, it's like David is saying. That's the same thing David was saying. Keep believing God. Yes. Keep believing what the word says in spite of everything else. Don't give yourself excuses. Don't, don't let yourself be confused. Stay with what the word says. Let me just give you a few types here. 1 Samuel chapter 16, and we'll read verse 1 through 13. 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 13. Now, y'all probably know these stories, but let's look at it in the context of what we're talking about and how David operated. All right, 1 Samuel 16, and verse 1, he says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil. Go, I will send thee to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. For I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how, how can I go if Saul here? He will kill me and, and so on. Keep going. <clears throat> and Je call Jesse to the sacrifice. I'll show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto him whom I, whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake. And came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town temple trembled at his coming. said, comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to sacrifice. And it came to pass, when they were come, he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. He looked like he'd probably be a good, a good king. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. In other words, the Lord says, I don't, look, I don't judge things by the natural thing that I see. I judge by the Spirit. Amen. All right? That's, we are the image of God. We are the children of God. That's how we're supposed to function. So then Jesse called 
Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shema to pass by, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he cometh hither. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ready with all a beautiful countenance and goodly to look at. To the, and the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for he is to be king. I know we can't see that, but that's what he says. Can you go on to verse 13? And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Amen. He was anointed. The Spirit came upon him. We have the anointed one. The Spirit is with us. Amen. He's in us. Praise the Lord. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Okay. Now, David's anointed king. And he goes back to the, she the sheepfold. Amen. But his brothers go to war. Now, he's the king, anointed of God. And he's just out here herding sheep again, back just doing exactly what he had been doing before he got anointed. Before God called him out. All right? So, uh, 1 Samuel 17 through 26 now. 1 Samuel chapter 1, 17 through 26. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Okay. 17 through 26. Verse 17 through 26. I'm sorry. I'm confusing you. So Jesse said unto David his sons, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn. These ten loaves, run to the camp of thy brethren, carry these ten cheeses unto the certain uh, captain of their th thousands, and look and, and how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. Saul and they, all the men of Israel, were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. David rose up early in the morning, the sheep keeper took and went. As Jesse had commanded him, he came to the trench as the host was going forth to fight, and shouted for the battle. Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion of the Philistines of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, spake according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king, will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man, amen, that, that kills this Goliath? For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, and David spoke to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? All right? So Israel's on one side, Goliath and the Philistines are on the other side, and David says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that's defying God and his people? Why does David look at this completely different than everybody else? Than all the armies, or the King Saul... How, how come he's speaking differently to the situation? Because he's anointed of God. Amen. And because he says what God says to him. Amen. You are anointed by God. Amen. What's your anointing for? To expand the kingdom of God. To, to take the kingdom wherever you go. Amen. All right. 1 Samuel 17 verses 28 through 30. We are to act for God. Yes. Not that God can't do it himself, but God will not break his word that he has given man authority in this earth. God's access to this earth is through human beings. Yes. That's, the, that's the rules he set up. Yes. Amen. So Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest down hither? And whom hast thou uh, left those few sheep in the wilderness? In other words, he's just mocking him. He said, what are you doing down here? And, and who's watching those few sheep that you're supposed to, that's your job, you know? And I know your pride, the naughtiness of your heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? So he says, I see you're, you're arrogant, you're proud. And it's like the guy said, uh, you know, the church took a vote and found the guy to be the most humble one in the church. And they gave him a, a big pin that said, Mr. Humility, you know, but they had to take it away from him as soon as he started wearing it. Praise the Lord. So, 
And he turned from toward uh, another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. So the brothers are saying, who, what, who do you think you are? And, and what are you doing down here running off at the mouth? And so on and so forth. Look, David had the spirit of faith. He believed, therefore he spoke. Right? We have, we are David in the spirit of faith. Yes. Amen? Yes. Psalms 116 verse 10, we, we read that earlier. He said, therefore, I, you don't have to go there, Peter. <clears throat> but he said, I believe, therefore have I spoken. Right. Amen? David just kept speaking. Yes. Right? All right, 1 Samuel 17 verse 31 through 37. I believe, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. When the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, You're not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him. You're just a kid. And, and he's a man of war. He has been since he was a kid. And David said to Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. There came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he's going to deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Then go, and the Lord be with thee. Amen? Amen? So David says, look, I had this experience with a lion and with a bear. Yeah. Yeah. Never really talked about it much because I didn't need to. But since you're questioning me, I'm going to tell you, God's done some stuff for me already. I know what God can do. I know what God will do. So here's the question. What are you saying and what are you doing when nobody's watching? Right. And I'm not talking about bad behavior. I'm talking about what's your confession when there's nobody around. I mean, how, how are you acting, amen, when there's not an audience? Praise the Lord. Verse 43 and 44, Peter. Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I'll give the, the flesh, your flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Praise the Lord. So, David's brothers ridiculed him. He just kept speaking the word. Saul questioned his ability. David just kept speaking the word. The enemy mocks him and intimidates him. But David just keeps speaking the word. Look at verse 45 and 46. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take your head. Amen. <clears throat> and from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the hosts of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Praise the Lord. David did what he said. This is how we're supposed to function so all the world will know there is a God, amen, that rules and reigns over everything. Praise the Lord. So back to 2 Corinthians 4.13 again. We had that same spirit of faith. Therefore, we have the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believe, therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Amen. Genesis 1, 1 through 3. Yeah. Yeah. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. That Spirit is in you. Yeah. Amen. That same Spirit that moved upon the face of the waters. And then verse 3. And God said, why? Because the Spirit moved, God spoke as a result, amen, let there be light, and there was light. And then for, I think, nine times, He says, let there be, let there be, let there be, let there be, and there was, and there was, and there was, and there was, everything He said, let be, became, amen. 
So that spirit, that very same spirit that created everything on the earth, amen, by words, is the spirit of faith. It's the spirit that dwells within each one of us. Now if God, by the spirit of faith, and spoken words can create a universe, can create everything that there is, do you not think that by, by that same spirit functioning in the same way that we can't change some crap in this world that's messing with us? Some stuff that is trying to deny that it looks like chaos, it looks like confusion, but there is a spirit hovering just waiting for a word to act on. Yes. And that spirit is in you. Yes. That is the spirit of faith. Yes. Yes. Look, grace is activated in your life by faith. Grace just doesn't do stuff. You've got to believe. Yes. We believe, therefore we speak. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Why? Because He said I am. I'm saying it. Grace makes that a reality. But I've got to believe it. Right? right. People aren't saved just because Jesus died for everybody. They've got to exercise faith. They've got to believe. That's the same way with healing. You don't get healed just because Jesus suffered those stripes for your healing. You've got to believe and you've got to say something. Yes. Prosperity, it all works the same way. Amen. The spirit of faith. God's plan for you. God's grace for you is by faith. And faith comes by the word of God. Amen. Matthew 12, 34 and 35. It's taking longer than I thought. Praise the Lord. Matthew 12, 34 and 35. O generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speak. The good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. Evil man out of the evil, evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth evil things. How does he bring it forth? He speaks. How can you speak good things if you're evil? Right? Out of the good treasure, out of the good treasure. What We have this treasure... In earthen vessels. Out of this spirit of faith, we can speak and get good things. Without it, what we're speaking in the natural, we're going to get the results of that. Because he goes on and look at verse 36 and 37. You're either believing the promises of God or you're believing the lies of the devil. So, I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. But for by the words you speak, that for the, by thy words... Thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. In other words, by your words you're going to be blessed, or by your words you're going to get cursed. Right. Yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. See, you've got some power, you've got some authority, and I, can, I guarantee you it works because if you've got crap going on, it's because... Yeah. 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 Hey, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. You have the power to change it. Yes. Yes. But you've got to... Speak what you believe. Amen. Romans 10 8. What saith that the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart? That is the word of faith which we preach. So if you're going to walk in God's plan, you have to speak it. Uh, yeah. Genesis 17 1. You don't have to go there, Peter, but just because this is after Ishmael was born. In fact, I think the verse just before that it was the last verse in, in chapter 16 of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Genesis. It's talking about Ishmael being born and how old Abraham. Abraham had deviated from the plan of God. In other words, he didn't, he, he didn't really believe everything God told him in the way that God told it to him. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had Ishmael. Right? right? So, after Ishmael is born... God comes back to Abraham and he said, Now, Abraham, the promise I gave you is still set because I gave the promise. So he says, Now, here's what I'm asking you to do is walk perfectly before me. Now, we know nobody's going to do that. Nobody can walk perfectly. But what God was saying, don't deviate from the promise. Yes. That's, that's how we are perfect in the eyes of God. We believe what God said and we don't change the plan for, to fit our circumstance. That's what he meant by walk perfectly before me. In other words, he's saying, look, you've been wandering all over this thing and doing it crazy. And you're making it difficult for me to fulfill the promise. But the promise still stands. Right. What I've come forth out of my mouth, I will not change. Right. But I need you to walk perfectly. I need you to trust. I need you to believe me. Yes. Okay? 
So it's not, we're not righteous by what we do any more than Abraham was righteous by what he did. We are righteous because in whom we believe. He believed God and God said, you're righteous. He didn't do anything. He, he just believed what God said. Amen. So by faith, you enter in to grace. You confess it and you believe it. All right. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35 through 39. I'm trying to go faster because I'm changing gears a little bit here. 35 through 39. And cast not away therefore your confidence which hath great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God you might receive the promise. That's where we are in a lot of these situations. Right? We've got to, we've got to be not casting away our confidence or giving up on God because there's this great reward available if we'll stay faithful to it, if we'll walk perfectly, right? Because we have to have patience yes. for this to come to pass. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition or who question God and then go back to the old way of trying to do things but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Praise the Lord. He is talking about better faith. Yes. Better faith. Amen. All right. Hebrews 11, 11. Through faith also Sarah received herself. Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age. Why? Because she judged him faithful who had promised. All right? The God who promised is faithful to His promises. Yes. All right? If you can, let's, let's go back to verse 10 and read through verse 16. So it says, Abraham was looking, he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky. Now he's talking about the offspring that come from, from the promise to Abraham. And as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. All, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them. Therefore sprang there even, okay, so in, and having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. Now, we talk about this all the time, the metaphors, the types, and the shadows, and that's what, what we're dealing with right here. Abraham was looking for a promised land. He was looking for a country, and that country or that promised land was Jesus. Now, he didn't get to see Jesus, but he got to see manifestations of these promises. They were looking afar off. They were looking forward to a manifestation of Christ. Amen. They were seeing manifestations, but they didn't get to see Jesus. Amen. So he was looking for a, a, a promised land or for looking for Jesus. And the city he was looking for are the people of God. You don't have to go there, Peter, but you can just check this out for yourself because in Revelation 21, 2, it says, And I saw New Jerusalem, spiritual Jerusalem, which is us, coming down out of heaven, adorned as a bride for her groom. That was the city Abraham was looking for. The stars of the sky and the sand of the sea. The, the church that would come as a result of him believing God. Him coming and, and having this, touching Jesus or reaching out to Jesus. Amen. The city that he was looking for was the church. The new Jerusalem. Amen. So Hebrews 11, 11 again. He says, by faith Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. That seed was Jesus. Amen. Galatians 3.29. If you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed. Right? So that's what he's talking about there. Jesus told the Jews. They said, we have Abraham to our father. He said, if Abraham was your father, you'd believe me. Yeah. You'd have faith. Right? Amen. All right. So Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. Abraham was 99 now. And she was like 86 or something. 
just ask you the question. Have you ever thought, I don't know if this will ever happen. God made me a promise, but you know, it, it looks like it's going to be harder for him to do it today than it would have been back when he told me. Even though it was almost impossible then, in my mind, how can he do it now? Genesis 18, verses 1 through 14. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre and sat in the door, tent door in the heat of the day and lifted up his eyes and looked. And lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. And said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort your hearts, so after that ye shall pass on. For therefore are ye come to, to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened unto the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the earth hearth. And Abraham ran into the herd, fetched a calf tender and good, gave it to, unto a young man, and hasted to dress it. He took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah your wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. Now this is a manifestation of God in the flesh. It's not Jesus. It's pre-Jesus, but it's God coming in a man's form to speak to him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. In other words, she was no longer having her cycle. She was not fertile. She was not going to have babies. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? So God stops at a tent of Abraham, and Sarah laughs. But here's what's critical to see. Shall I, being old, have pleasure, my Lord being old also? See, the intellect and the flesh, religion, puts pressure on us to produce. And we forget it's about enjoying the Lord. Yes. Now, I'm going to just say, because it's all adults up here. She wasn't just talking about the pleasure of having a son. She was talking about the pleasure of intercourse. Amen? Amen? And it's a metaphor for us and our relationship with Jesus. I'm not talking sex here. I'm just saying we are supposed to find pleasure in our Lord. Not just in the end result. Right? So she, she wasn't just talking about am I going to be happy when I have a baby? No, she's, going to, she's saying am I going to enjoy the process? Till I get to the outcome. Yeah. Till I get to the fu total fulfillment of this. Okay, praise the Lord. <clears throat> Sally and I went to, or we didn't go, but we rented that movie, uh, I Can Only Imagine. And uh, she had seen it, her and the, Tammy, and I think some of them had gone to the theater to see it. But I hadn't, she was in convinced I needed to see it and uh, so she read it and it was a, it really is a good movie it really is if you haven't seen it it's good but I want to just read because it really what spoke to me was the song itself I mean I understand the whole surrounding scenario and everything that went on and what the what the great transition in his dad and all these things that took place but the thing that impressed me was this idea he said I can only imagine <coughs> excuse me what it will be like when I walk by your side, I can only imagine what my eyes will see. When your face is before me, I can only imagine. I can only imagine he's talking about Jesus, right? And the chorus says, surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Or will I be able to speak at all? 
I can only imagine. I can only imagine. And then there's another verse, and then it goes back to the chorus again. But the point to me is joy. Yes. Heaven's not going to be, oh my God. No, heaven's going to be, I, 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 what do I do? I mean, I, I want to dance before you. I want to hug you. I want to kiss you. I want to, yes. you know, all these things I want to do. And I'm, I'm so awed. Yes. I don't know what to do. Yes. Right? I mean, it's like, we're not intimidated. We're so in love. So, so we want to enjoy it. We want to it's celebrate, you know? And God, I'm telling you, what God is speaking to me is that He wants us to feel that way now. He wants us to have that kind of experience and, and relationship with Him now. Will I find pleasure with my Lord? Not when I get to heaven, but now. Not when I get my whatever the manifestation is I'm believing for right now, a financial breakthrough, a healing, or but can I enjoy the process till I get my manifestation? Can I just enjoy the fact that I've got Jesus, that I've got the Lord, and can I just have pleasure in the reality of this relationship that I have? So Isaiah chapter 12, verse 1 through 6. And that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee, though thou wast angry with me. Thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day shall ye say, Praise the Lord. Call upon His name. Declare His doings among the people. Make mention that His name is exalted. Sing unto the Lord, for He hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Praise the Lord. When you get back to the joy of your salvation, you'll have to work to not produce. Praise the Lord. The Lord told Sarah, you'll have a son. His name will be Isaac. Laughter. Praise the Lord. When I'm old, will I have pleasure with my Lord who is also old? So another metaphor for that is will I enjoy the process of getting pregnant? Will I find pleasure in the process or just in the finished product? God wants it to be pleasurable for you while you wait for your miracle. I believe it. Another thought of Sarah's, and another way of looking at this is, when I finally have this child, am I going to be too old to enjoy the child? Will I be able to do the things with this child that I wanted to do or would have wanted to do when I was young. Right. When I was physically, how many grandparents you got that just, you know, you just don't do everything with the grandkids that you did with your kids. Yeah. You want to, but you just can't do it. <laughs> can't, just can't do it all, amen? But this is, I think, in her mind too, is am I gonna be able to enjoy the child? Am I gonna be able to do the things? Will I be too old to enjoy the promise when it finally comes? God wants to give you pleasure in His promises. Not the spirit of fear, but power to enjoy the promises. The pleasure of experiencing them. The joy of the manifestation that comes. The promises of God in Jesus are yes and amen. The power of God doesn't come by might or by strength, but by His Spirit, the Spirit of faith. Amen? And that Spirit speaks. 1 Peter 1, 3-13. This will be the last scripture. 1 Peter 1, 3-13. If you're not having fun, 
You're doing it wrong. Right. Praise the Lord. That's true. I can tell you what Woody Allen used to say. They asked him if he thought sex was dirty, and he said, only if you're doing it right. This is still church, praise the Lord. <laughs> Whatever that means to you, it's fine. Okay. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth though it be tried with fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ whom having not seen you love in whom though now you see him not yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory <coughs> receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your souls of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you <clears throat> searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow unto whom it was revealed uh, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven which things the angels desire to look into Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So here's what I'm saying. What if we really believe the promises? If you really, just listen to what I'm saying, if you really believe the promise, you can have pleasure in the process. The reason you don't have pleasure is because you're not sure about the promise. So you're still struggling. You're still trying to make something happen, right? When we really settle it, that what He has promised, He is faithful to perform, then you can enjoy the process. Then you can find pleasure in the whole thing. Amen? God waited until Abraham and Sarah were beyond a doubt humanly impossible for them to reproduce. He waited that long. He waited for that. And guess what? They began to enjoy one another. Yeah. They began to enjoy each other. And the seed was conceived and was birthed. So the, the word really is when we stop trying to produce and just start enjoying. Yeah. When we stop trying to do it and just start enjoying the Lord. Yes. Just start enjoying the relationship. The promises are birthed. Yes. The word of God comes to pass. Mm -hmm. And it happens in laughter. The joy of the Lord. Yes. Yes. Start enjoying the relationship. And what you confess will produce. And it will produce laughter in the process. Praise the Lord. Be the thermostat. Yes. Call for the promises of God. And just laugh at the devil. Yeah. We have the spirit of faith. So we believe. And because we believe, we speak. Praise the Lord. Amen. If you're not having fun, you're doing something wrong. Enjoy it. Yes. Enjoy the relationship. Yes. No, he's, He loves you. Yes. He's the Lord that loves you and wants to give you pleasure in this relationship yes. 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 all the way through it. Yes. While you're waiting for the promises, while you're believing for the promises, when the promises come, yeah. and He wants you to just enjoy Him on the, tro on, on the, on the road to the next fulfillment right. based on what He's already done. Right. And if you're struggling, if you're 
alienated from the Lord. You see, it, it, it undermines everything he's trying to do. Yeah. Causes you to draw back to perdition. Yeah. And you can't get what God wants to give you. But if you'll embrace him, enjoy him, the natural result is baby miracles start coming. Mm -hmm. Good stuff starts happening. Yes. And you can enjoy the entire process. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. God bless you. Appreciate your patience. Let's, let's enjoy the Lord. He wants us to, to have fun here, not just plan a big party when we get to heaven. We can have a party going on right here and right now. Amen. And watch God move in our lives at the same time. Praise the Lord. God bless all of you. Appreciate you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Start calling for some stuff. <laughs>